welcome to Pro Baseball World Tour. My name is Rick Crabb, and co-hosting the show with me from his palatial estate in the Big Apple is Eric Marenbeck. Eric, thank you for joining us, and thanks for co-hosting this with me. I've been looking forward to doing this show with you all week. I am actually psyched to do this. This is my first podcast. Okay, well, hopefully first of many, and hopefully... First of many listeners after this as well. And folks, of course, do the usual YouTube things with this. Like, subscribe, comment. We will Every episode we will post a premiere to allow you to do that. And, well, actually live commentary. We can talk back to you. But then you can comment, of course, after that as well. So, anyway. Um, great, yeah. Well, to start things off, Eric, uh, I wanted to introduce... The listeners to myself and you as far as our interest in baseball just to get the show off the ground i don't want to be too john too boogie zombie ish but you know i and talk about personal stuff i'd rather just get right to the baseball talk but i think it would be interesting just to introduce ourselves and especially talking to you with your interest in baseball this is part of the reason i wanted to do the show because you have traveled a lot of places, not only major minor leagues, but a lot of international games as well. Um, yeah. I'll start with myself. Um, basically, I'm from the Baltimore area. I, my first love of anything, whether comics were probably my maybe a close second, but love of anything is the Baltimore Orioles, and I've been suffering ever since for it. Um, not at first. When I was young, I wasn't suffering, but... Basically, after 1983, um, I have been ever since, but still love the team. Born and raised on them. My father and my grandfather took me to a lot of ball games. I'm fortunate that the Orioles had also opened a lot of minor league affiliates nearby, so I enjoyed going to their games as well. I haven't traveled to too many games, unlike Eric, which we'll get into in a second. Farthest I have actually traveled to a game, though, was... Myrtle Beach, I actually got to see the Orioles single-A affiliate play against the Myrtle Beach team, who was affiliated at the time, I think, with the Braves. Now, I think, with, they're with Texas. But anyway, that's how I roll with that. And also, the yeah, reason Eric and I met is through a mutual fandom of the Korean baseball organization. Um, we joined, both joined the My KBO Facebook group. Hopefully, a lot of you folks from that group are listening. Um, hopefully we can even talk to some of you in future episodes. But we grew, you know, we both had a, a appreciation for those teams. And I think, Eric, you can comment how long you've been a fan of that league, as well as the CPBL in Taiwan. I just, I'm like a lot of American fans. I just started watching the KBO with the ESPN broadcast. But now I follow them on Twitch. And actually, some I enjoy a lot of those broadcasts more than the ESPN ones but anyway as they say enough about me tell me about you eric what what was your interest in baseball elaborate on that if you would sir well let's let's start off with this first of all at least our pro uh, baseball alliance is kind of similar as far as american league east i've been a yankee fan pretty much all my life started going to baseball uh in 1977-ish, mm-hmm. and I believe that one of my first games was the Reggie Jackson three home run game against the Dodgers. Oh wow, I was I was going to say that's a good time to start being a Yankees fan. It's like I don't know, it's kind of I don't know if you ever saw the movie Basketball. It was it run by the two two people who run <laughs> South Park. Yeah, they actually I think one of them was a big Reggie Jackson fan. And I think was at that game too. So he, he was probably next to you in the stands, but <laughs> but. Yeah, so, so anyway, I've been going to a lot of uh, Yankee games, especially when I started driving mm-hmm. at the age of 18. I was going to go by myself, otherwise I'd have to depend on somebody else to drive me and or public transportation. As far as international stuff, I started getting into that in the year 2000. Mm. The Yankees drafted a guy who is very well known by the name of Chen Ming Wong. Oh, nice. Who, who at that time was the only Taiwanese pitcher that I knew of. Uh, apparently there were some in the past, but I had no clue. So we went to a game where he first pitched, which actually the Yankees had a farm team at the time 
in Staten Island. Mm. And their first year, they were at the College of Staten Island. Oh, okay. So it was a very homey atmosphere. Was it still the Penn New York League then, or? It, it was the Penn League, and it was a matter of fact, uh, that was the first year, I believe, that the Yankees had moved their farm team from Oneonta to Staten Island. Mm. But the stadium where they wound up in Staten Island wasn't quite ready yet. So they were first playing their games at the College of Staten Island, where it was more open and everything, because I guess they couldn't find a facility to actually play their games in. Right. Yeah. So, so what wound up happening was that facility was very, very fan friendly. Whereas the players would basically walk past you and, you know, not necessarily from the autograph standpoint, but, you know, just to say hello. Right. So, I don't know, all of a sudden I get involved and I start talking to this guy, Chen Ming Wong, who at the time to me was, was nothing. Okay, he was just one of the guys on the team. All of a sudden, it started to blossom into this phenomenon where I started to watch and at that time the only other streaming service that was available was a thing called Justin.tv. I don't know if you remember it back in the day. Mm, it it kind of rings a bell. I don't remember getting on it. It, actually, day, but... it actually was the reason why Twitch uh, came into existence. Mm, interesting. Because Twitch was a spin-off of Justin. Uh, Twitch wound up becoming the gaming aspect where Justin was just, like, streaming other things. Right. Anywho, what had happened was we got to the point where I was watching these games streamed from Taiwan because of Wong. Mm. And... Of course, everybody else in the chat rooms were speaking Chinese, and I was like the lone wolf. So next thing you know, these Taiwanese kids that are in the chat rooms are getting really impressed with me that I was actually into the sport that they played, even though it was the same sport, but it was kind of different right. because of their style of play. Mm -hmm. And it just mushroomed. Next thing you know, one guy mentions me in a message board that's very popular in Taiwan, and all of a sudden I'm getting all these social media uh, requests to get added to Facebook. Oh, no kidding. And it just, and it just broke off. <laughs> so, be that as it may, all of a sudden, Wong moves up the ranks. He goes from... Low-time link to uh, Staten Island, and he moves up through double-A, triple-A, and he makes it up to the Yankees. Nice. And, you know, at the time, going to minor league games was great, and I'm sure you appreciate it, too, being from the Baltimore area. Sure. Where you'll get a guy that you've been talking to through certain levels, and then all of a sudden, he'll make it up to the show. Hmm. And they appreciate every level that you follow them in. So to see them in the show, it just, you know, it makes them smile, you know? Yeah. All of a sudden, I became, like, Wong's biggest fan at Yankee Stadium. And all these Taiwanese people would see me with the Wong shirt, and I was kind of like the oddball, the only American that had the Wong craze. So it... it blossomed into this new newfound friendship with everybody. Next thing you know, I decide, okay, I'm watching all these games from Taiwan on the computer. I have to go. Mm. So compelled to actually watch their games somehow in Taiwan. So in 2011, I took a shot and with my parents, I, we actually flew to Taiwan uh, through Facebook. I got in touch with a bunch of people that decided they wanted to meet me there. Uh, we had 
some friends of mine take us up, uh, drive us to the ballpark, and I just met a whole bunch of players, and, you know, everybody that I'm meeting, it's just so cool. Right. And, and this has gone on now. I've been to Taiwan four times. I've been to the Mexican leagues. We did a winter league uh, trip back around five, six years ago. So I've done that. Uh, and as far as the KBO, I just started getting into all the other leagues. And the imports that they were bringing from the States, I had already known them. Hmm. So, so when these guys you're watching them from a different country, it just makes you appreciate it more. Oh yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah, I think that's, that's one of the reasons why I picked my team of choice in the KBO, the LG Twins, because of Hansu Kim. I, mean, I remember him playing with the Orioles, and the only thing I knew about the KBO then was they had announced that when the Korean version of whatever the big MLB video game, I think it was MLB The Show that year. They had him, in the Korean release, they had him as the cover athlete. Um, they didn't do that in this country, but for the Korean audience, they did. And he had him, you know, hitting a ball in a road Orioles uniform, but I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. But, um, well, yeah, that's, that's cool that you got to do all that. And it's amazing how... When, all it takes is meeting one person, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's like that old commercial, you know, they tell their two friends, and their two friends, and so on. It sounds like you uh, got a big yeah. network out of that. <laughs> that that's, how it, that's how it's mushroomed. It's like, all of a sudden, the, the kid puts my, mentions my name in this international board, which in Taiwan, I think they call it PTT. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, I wake up the the next morning and it's like hundreds of, well, day by day there were more like hundreds of people friend requesting me on Facebook. Nice. I didn't know these people from a hole in the wall, <laughs> but I kept accepting them basically because of the love of the game. Very cool. Yeah, that's one thing I noticed about the MyKBO group, especially the Korean nationals or even folks from our country and European countries that reside in Korea and watch it. It's a very positive experience. I've yet to see any kind of usual social media negativity you see on Facebook or any other thing in this group. Great bunch of people there. I, yeah, I, I, I can't stand negativity when it comes to the, you know, the farm league. At least, at least watch it and try it. Oh, yeah. And then judge for yourself. You know, don't automatically, like, treat it as a negative thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate it for what it is, and... You've read my comments on the group, and um, you, you and other people have too. It's like, I enjoy the ESPN broadcast to an extent, but some of the, especially the guest announcers like Tim Carson, I mean, they, he kept going on and on Thursday night with the Yankees and the Nets saying, it's great to finally have baseball. Um, idiot, you were on baseball broadcast for three months getting up, you know. Where there was right. one case where you, you didn't know which announcer you were talking to. I mean, come on, man. And and, and I'll tell you I'll tell you another funny story. You know, everybody was talking baseball's back, baseball's back. Okay. Right. Baseball actually started this year on April twelfth when the CPBL in Taiwan uh, got underway. Oh, I didn't know that. They started so, before Korea. I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, they actually did. They were fanless for a while, and then all of a sudden. He started to uh, admit fans. The, the first uh, plateau was a thousand. They weren't going by percentages; they just mm -hmm. went by numbers. Right. So they started with a thousand, then they upgraded to two thousand, and then they went for broke. Mm, nice. And you know what? I'm glad they did because I'm sure you know with KBL, the fan experience with between the fans and the chants. And the cheerleaders and the whole aspect, that's what makes the game. No doubt, no doubt. I'm looking forward to this Sunday's broadcast, which we're going to comment about later, where I, I mean, I've been, and you have probably been doing the same, watching old YouTube videos of previous season games. And, and it reminded me of the Tom Selleck movie, Mr. Baseball, with the Japanese audience, how they interact. Yep. And their chance to kind of also remind me of like the old, of like European 
soccer fanatics too. You know, same kind of thing. They have specific songs. You know, trolling the opposing teams, that kind of thing. I mean, it, it sounded like a lot of fun. Although I think the Koreans, I think they were more positive and they were more nice. They were just more or less just doing walk-up songs for whoever was at bat for the home teams and all. But. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, the beautiful thing about Taiwan is, and I'm sure they do it in Korea too, they have both teams chantable. Right. Obviously, the home team is going to get the louder of the chants, but there's no booing, as I'm sure it's that way in Korea also. Mm -hmm. uh, but the road team fans are normally out in the outfield. So... In a TV broadcast or over the computer, you can actually hear them, faint as it is, but they're still chanting, you know, their players chant songs, and it's still a cool thing. That's why, that was another reason why I really got into Taiwan baseball, listening to all the fan atmosphere. Hmm. Well, yeah, it, it, that sounds like a lot of fun. Now, let me ask you this, Eric, as far as fan atmosphere, one of the other things that sounded really fun with the Korean games, although I heard this season they're going to limit some of that but it was like there was a lot of experience fan experience as far as like fans bringing in food bringing in their beer they they had the popular term tea neck with the basically with the hot chicken wings and the beer and all that um what was the experience with taiwan like with that was that was there any similarities any differences they had, they had vendors um you could bring in whatever you wanted. I believe that there was some sort of stipulation with alcohol, though. Hmm. Yeah, I had heard you with... You couldn't bring it in. Oh, you couldn't bring it in? Okay. Yeah, it's... Because I, I had heard with Korea, what they did is they wouldn't allow you to bring in any bottles, but they would have, they, they would have like, the vendors outside. They would, like, you know, pour it in a cup. They had, like, a little backpack right. of beer or whatever. I, yeah, I think, it was, I think it was the same way in Taiwan, too. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. All right, very good. All right, folks, we're going to take a break for a little bit. And when we return, we're going to talk about different baseball leagues throughout the world. We'll start with the leagues in North America, particularly Major League Baseball, and actually a couple of independent minor leagues that actually played games with fans in the stands in the United States. Yes, it's true. We'll be right back, folks. All right, fans, welcome back to the Pro Baseball World Tour here on YouTube. My name is Rick Crabb and my co-host, Eric Marenbach. And we're going to start discussing different baseball leagues right now. We're going to start with North America. We, normally, we would be talking about Canada and the United States, but there is one item regarding that. There was one item in the news regarding the sole Canadian Major League Baseball team, the Toronto Blue Jays. Originally... They were granted permission to practice at Rogers Center, a.k.a. Sky Dome. But then the Canadian government decided not to allow any actual games. I guess they were concerned about the American teams bringing up the COVID spikes into their country. So the Blue Jays have been since trying to negotiate a summertime home. It started off, they were talking about their minor league facility in Buffalo, maybe their training facility in Florida. Then they were talking to the Pittsburgh Pirates about doing some home games at PNC Park. The Pennsylvania government there declined that. Then they were talking to my hometown Baltimore Orioles about playing in Camden Yards. Even got like a few fans, older Oriole fans joking about as long as they don't bring Cito Guest in there. But, um, event <laughs> but eventually the there was an issue with, I think, with the state government, probably with the Maryland Stadium Authority, something, something along those lines. I don't think it was with the Orioles per se. I think it was with it was another governmental issue. Then they were being courted by the mayor of Hartford, Connecticut, about playing at their minor league facility, which I think is a Triple A facility. And then I saw, thought I saw today, they decided to go with the home of their Triple A team, 
Buffalo, which is 62 miles from Toronto. Originally, they were going to shy away from it because they thought the clubhouses would be too small or, and the lighting wasn't suitable. In fact, now, I, now that I mention that, that's the issue with the Orioles. The Orioles didn't want the, to share their clubhouses or their dugouts or, or their other facilities with the Blue Jays. And the Blue Jays were even talking about building separate ones in the stadium, but somehow I guess that fell through. So, so Buffalo, New York, welcome your new Toronto Blue Jays for a summer. So, what do you think of that, Eric? <laughs> you know what? I, I actually thought that that was their only alternative from the get-go. When they were negotiating with Baltimore, Pittsburgh, whatever, I had my doubts only because you would have figured that they would have had to share facilities. Right. The Florida and or Arizona type aspects were out the window, especially because with COVID now, you've got those are the two bigger spikes as far as states go. That's right. So I so I thought that those were out also. So I'm glad that they were able to come to an agreement with Buffalo because it's close to their facility as far as if they need to go back and forth for whatever reason. Right. Yeah, even though there might, there's kind of concern with the borders and all, too, even though they're, you know, 60 miles apart from each other. But, I mean, it's good. I'm sure their families are glad of that. They'll still be, you know, fairly close. They might be able to uh, maybe come to see them or stay with them, maybe like how the foreign players do with the KBO, get to stay with them in quarantine or whatever. Right. Okay. Well, and, and as I mentioned, Major League Baseball actually started their games this week. Um, we are recording this show on Saturday the 25th. They started on Thursday night the 23rd. Um, the very first game was held at Nats Park at, between the New York Yankees and the defending champion Washington Nationals. Um, what was interesting about that is they, at, as we've seen with the KBO, no fans in the stands, but... It was interesting, the PA announcers actually piped in crowd sound. And, of course, they, as well as all the other major league games, started off before the national anthem with the Black Lives Matter protest or demonstration, whatever you want to call them. Um, I don't know, your thoughts on those with, you know, I don't want to get too political on our show. Like I mentioned, we were positive with the Facebook group. I don't want to go down that track, but I don't know. What was your take on all of that? Uh, you know what? It probably had to be done with showing a solidarity thing between all the players on all the teams. I am able to separate politics from the actual game itself because right. one thing is that when you go to a game, you don't pay to hear the national anthem. You don't pay to see political statements. You pay to watch players on the field. Right. That's the most important aspect of any sport. Mm -hmm. So I knew it had to be done. I wasn't offended by it. Uh, there were people on obvious social media that were, and then you'll get your people that are saying, oh my God, I'm never going to watch this anymore, blah, blah, blah. Come on now, guys. Right. You've been watching your games for 40 some odd years. Don't stop now. And let's say it, you can say what you want on social media, mm -hmm. but deep down, unless there's a tracking device on you, we all know you're watching again, so cut it out. Right. And what's interesting, though, and I'll parlay this. I won't be talking too much on this show or any episode of this show about other sports, but I think a lot of it is coming from older fans, too. I remember, like, when Colin Kaepernick was doing his protests, my father and I used to be Baltimore Ravens season ticket holders. And a lot of their fans, the season ticket holders, I mean, they have some younger fans, too, but majority of their season ticket holders that were at every game were older fans who were Baltimore Colts fans in the 70s, were veterans. A lot of them I would talk to afterwards, a lot of them said, you know what, we're not renewing our season tickets. We are not coming back. You know, this is disrespect, especially when the Ravens actually did a protest in a game in England against the Jacksonville Jaguars. A lot of people 
I saw on Facebook a lot of people putting their Ravens gear up on sale or giving them away or it's like saying, you know, I'll give it to a good home. If not, I'm throwing it out. I mean, they were that outraged about it, Eric. I'm, I don't know if things will change this year. I'm reading some comments that it's not, but I think, I don't know, it might be a little more acceptance of it this time than when Kaepernick was playing and doing that. All right. Well, another news with that. In addition to Major League Baseball and the Toronto Blue Jays being allowed to play, I happened to stumble upon a couple of articles about a couple of independent minor leagues that were playing in the United States with fans. Now, as you know, Eric, and a lot of our listeners know, a lot of the minor leagues that were affiliated with the major league teams, such as like the Carolina League, the New York Penn League, on an International League, on and on and on, were they suspended operations this year. Uh, they just chose not to play their seasons, and a lot of the major league teams are using some of their double-A and triple-A team stadiums for their practice facilities, or in the Blue Jays' case, as their actual home facility. But, according to this article that I found from the New York Times, he said there was a league, let me find it, bear with me. There we go. It was an article written by the New York Times columnist Tim Arango. His headline was, Baseball in Middle, Middle America. Fans are in, autographs are out. And I'm going to scroll down a few paragraphs and just read a little bit of that article just to give you an idea what's going on. Okay. This is about maybe five paragraphs down. Major League Baseball will start its pandemic-shortened season this week, but there will be no fans in the stands. The minor league se season was canceled, depriving dozens of small towns of baseball this summer. Two prominent independent leagues, the Atlantic League and the Frontier League, are also not playing. That leaves us with four cities in Middle America. Fargo, North Dakota, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Franklin, Wisconsin, and Rosemont, Illinois, where professional baseball is being played in front of fans cautiously, joyfully, and hardly normally. In addition to that, they, the, that league is called the American Association. They had two teams come from Canada, one from Winnipeg and the other from St. John's, who are also playing games in, let's see, Winnipeg, they said they're going to play their home games at Fargo, so they're sharing with the Fargo team. The St. Saint Paul Saints are playing in Sioux Falls. And ironically, the St. Saint Paul Saints, where they play, is like one of their games, they actually had a dress in a hockey arena next to the baseball stadium that was having a Pro Bowl riders competition and they had to walk across the parking lot in their cleats in the pavement so probably by the time they got to the field their cleats were like down to almost nothing so but, but um let's see we'll scroll on down but i mean they like a lot of like the other sports with the bubbles they had basically players restricted to the hotels um they had strict guidelines with the fans and they even had them sign waivers that they are subjecting themselves to at risk to the COVID-19. So if they catch it, I guess, you know, the, the teams in the league aren't going to be liable. I guess it's almost like a foul, you get hit with a foul ball, you know, you're at your own risk, I guess. Um, right. So, so that, I mean, that's interesting. They even had, and they have limited capacity. For example, I'm reading, um, there was a stadium that was about half capacity of 4,500. Um, so, I mean, still, and what's interesting, I'm seeing some of the pictures. It was like they had, like, every other row was roped off with almost, like, police, yellow caution police tape. And they showed a shot of the crowd kind of like in the box seats where it said the majority of the crowd was not wearing masks. So I'm hoping we don't get any corona spokes in, spikes in the in the Dakotas, Eric, but it sounds like that could happen. I don't know. If it could... I mean, there are actually some pictures popping up of opening day in Washington where supposedly Dr. Fauci, who threw out the first pitch, was actually photographed not wearing his mask, uh, more or less wearing the mask as a chin strap, in and amongst two other friends that were with him at the stadium. And, you know, some wise-ass reporter is basically calling him a hypocrite, saying, you know. Right. 
you're telling everybody to wear masks and there you are doing whatever, whatever, whatever. What business is it of yours, on the other hand, to actually photograph it and, you know, run with a, run with a narrative like that? So, to yeah. double-edged sword. Yeah, I know that. I mean, it, it does give kind of a message. Maybe in his defense, though, I mean, there are some, maybe they were, I don't know who those, I saw that picture too. I don't know who the other individuals were. Maybe they were colleagues that he had worked with a lot. I mean, supposedly talk about, you know, they have like a circle of friends or family that, you know, you can. Well, it was never. later brought out that A, they were friends of his, and B, the only reason why, they, why he put his mask down, per se, was because he was drinking. Right. Now, unless there's a mask where somehow liquid will seep through it, and you're actually able to drink from it. Right. You know, I say you got to be able to pull down your mask. And whoever the wise ass was who took the photo and then ran with a, a story like this, what would be ashamed of himself. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, and that is difficult. I mean, that's a good point. I don't know. I know the restrictions have gone up and down in New York. I know for a while they were among the toughest. My state was among the toughest as well. Lately, they had eased restrictions with restaurants where they told you you had to basically you had to walk into the restaurant with your mask until you're seated, and then you can pull it down while you're eating. Now, some jurisdictions of Maryland, including the city of Baltimore, are actually peeling, making them more strict. They're actually not allowing indoor dining in some of the restaurants now because of some employees and customers testing positive for that. So. It's not over yet, folks. I mean, we got to do what we can. Just you know, protect yourself and others. You know, it's that's what that's what baseball is all about. Getting everybody home safe. You know what I mean? But absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, just just another just another comment about some of these independent leagues that are popping up. Uh-huh. Uh huh. A couple of leagues just started within the last week or so in my area, up in the Jersey, New York area. One is more or less a series of just one team split into two. Okay. Being the Somerset Patriots, and they split up into the opposing team being the New Jersey, uh, no, it's actually the Bridge, Bridgewater Blasters. Hmm. Because they play in Bridgewater, New Jersey, so that was kind of a cute little nickname. Okay. Another thing that they're doing is... They're, they're portraying it as a league, but to me, the caliber of the league is actually high school is short above. Right. It's called the All-American Baseball Challenge, where there's teams at Yogi Berra Stadium hmm. in New Jersey. Okay. Uh, the, the Sussex team, where, where it used to be the New Jersey Cardinals, but they're actually calling themselves the uh, Sussex Cardinals in homage to that. Uh, there's a team uh, actually called the Rockland Boulders, where it's, it would have been the New York Boulders, but they switched it back to Rockland. And there's a couple of other teams in there as well. So it's the New York, New Jersey area. But again, these are local kids. Uh, there may be one or two with prior minor experience, but it's basically... Negative, independent ball. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Okay, and you said you said they are allowing fans to those games, or they're allowing five hundred per stadium. Hmm. Uh, I know the stadium in Somerset holds around six, seven thousand people, which includes uh, the berm areas and stuff like that. But they're only allowing five hundred people in. Obviously, social distance, and I believe that uh, there are certain areas that are like roped off or barricaded off to make sure that you're sitting six feet apart. Okay. They're actually, they are actually, uh, Somerset actually has their own music channel, so you can tune into the games. There. They only have the games on the weekends. I believe it's Friday, Saturday. The other thing that All American Baseball Challenge, they started, as a matter of fact, uh, on Thursday, and they're doing their games Thursday through Sunday. Oh, nice. Okay. All right. That sounds like fun. Um, I don't know. There's probably a few people listening to this on the East Coast, probably near you or me saying, road trip. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but, um, okay, but 
I'll tell you what, um, folks, if you're interested in that, I, I'm going to get from Eric off the air the link to that league, and I'll post a description in, you know, under underneath the video on the YouTube channel. I came across a similar league, uh, and I, I don't know how it just popped up in my Facebook feed suddenly. Um, there was a league based in Utica, Michigan. I was going to flash this to you at first. I'm like, Utica, wait a minute, I'll tell Eric. But it's like, no, it's, it's another town. It's in Michigan. It's called the United Shore Baseball League. And it sounds similar to what you described, Eric, which is basically it's a developmental league where they take a lot of either major league organization cast-offs or a lot of kids who had just graduated college, maybe kind of like a filter in between them. Um, the difference with that league, they it's four teams based in the same stadium in Utica, Michigan. Um, and would, would they... Like I said, they are sharing that field. The stadium is called Jimmy John's Field. And the four teams that they have listed are the Birmingham Bloomfield Beavers, <laughs> the East Side Diamond Hoppers, the Utica Unicorns, and the West Side Woolly Mammoths. And but just like as you mentioned with the All-American Baseball Challenge, they also air their games on, for free on Facebook and YouTube. Now, I had even written, written an email back and forth with one of the marketing directors of the league itself, because I, I bought some merch. Um, I'll admit to it. <laughs> uh, I asked her, I said, listen, are you, how long is your season? Because they had it spaced out where Sunday the 26th, up to that point, was the last game. And they'd only played, like, I don't know, three weeks of baseball. I'm like, is that the end of your season? You have playoffs coming up? She said, no, we're just taking it week by week because of the pandemic, but we will update the schedule, and I see that she did. I see they have, like, the next slate of games, and I see four games listed, and they all have links to watch them on either YouTube or Facebook. So I will send a link to that league as well. Um, so, brief, so... And it, and it's, it's funny you mention it because I actually... Ran across it on YouTube. There, there are times when we have a little bit of downtime mm -hmm. when there's no major league game or minor league game that I go to. Right. And I have one of those nothing better to do but search the web or just scan YouTube for no particular reason. So I actually came across that league and I saved that channel on my channel directory. I, I think I watched maybe one or two games, but it's very, very quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the only people that are actually in the stands are family members. Yeah, I watched uh, the game once, and like, that's what it looked like. It was a no, and it was interesting. The, the one statement, one thing I like about that statement, it kind of reminds me of, um, I forget what it's called now. I think it's Progressive Park. It was Jacobs Field, the Cleveland Indian Stadium. They have, like, their suites, instead of high up in the stadium, they have them kind of like at base level, pretty much. You know, like along the warning track, it's basically like from basically from one dugout to the other. They have it's almost like a tunnel underneath the box seats where you can watch the games. And I, I don't know, I thought that was kind of cool, but it looks like a yeah. nice little ballpark. But you know, folks in Michigan, I hope you have fun watching them. Um, if you if you have seen those games, you're a fan of those teams or that league, um, feel free to comment about that as well. Uh, so, so baseball, they're still trying to keep it alive here in the USA, and, you know, hopefully we'll keep everybody alive doing it. So, <laughs> right. I, I think basically, as long as you have some sort of distraction from all the rest of the stuff that's going on in this world, baseball being the first sport that actually committed to a starting date, all the rest of the sports are going to, you know, fall into place and do that. But baseball coming to the forefront, I think it's an excellent thing to do just for morale in this country. Right, definitely. I mean, it's almost like you feel like your routine is somewhat getting back to normal. I mean, you have... You have anyway. Yeah, what's that? Trying to, anyway. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean... With all a lot of negativity going on, you need something positive to you know to watch, whether it be baseball or 
or movies or TV show. I mean, you can't even go to the movies now unless it's like a drive-in theater now with older films. It's like most of the new films, they either go right to Disney Direct or Amazon Prime or whatever, but new, new, yeah, you can't go to your Cineplex to see a movie now. Hopefully that'll change within a year or so, but, you know. Okay, well, all right, folks, we're going to take another break, and when we get back, we're going to talk some KBO. And we'll go over the standings, go over a few items that went, happened this past week in the league, and one thing that's going to start with this particular week that hasn't happened all season. You're listening to the Pro Baseball World, World Tour here on YouTube. Folks, welcome back to Pro Baseball World Tour. Rick Crab once again with Eric Marenbach. And now we're going to talk about the Korean Baseball Organization. The baseball league that Eric and I met and became friends over. So definitely, a, you know, be a special place in my heart for that. Um, well, we had a few things happen this past week. The, Han the Fighting Hanwha Eagles, those poor guys. They actually had the debut of Brandon Barnes last week. He was he came into the country under Korean in Korean protocol, had to quarantine for two weeks. Finally, got to play his first games on July 18th, and against my LT Twins, much to my chagrin, he got his first baseball hit, his first hit, which happened to be a double, and a great. So sportsmanship, and I know the major leagues and the minor leagues here do that as well. After his hit, the Twins gathered the baseball and they rolled it into the Hanwha dugout. And I guess like someone on the staff actually wrote down in English and Korean, Brandon Barnes first baseball hit, you know, July 18th or whatever. And I thought that I thought that was pretty cool to see. Yeah, I, I'll be interesting. Uh, I don't even know if Addison Rumble has gotten an appearance yet, but I want to see how he actually produces with his new KBO team. Hmm. Yeah, that should be interesting. I mean, that's one nice thing about this. ESPN actually has, a, you know, they try to introduce American audiences saying, well, you know, Tyler Wilson used to play for Baltimore, Hunsu Kim used to play for Baltimore. Roberto Ramos was in the Rockies organization. So there is some ties to this country so they can orient the American audience. I think sometimes they try to be too America-centric. And a lot of it is more, I think, too memorabilia in their home studio-centric, you know, especially with John Chiambi, that turkey, I swear. <laughs> but, but, um, okay. And also, we were talking about fans in the stands that, some minor league games here in the United States. The KBO, for the first time on Sunday, July 26th, will allow fans in their ballparks. They are going by percentages. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, I think the percentage is like 10% for each stadium. And I think the, only, heard, yeah. Yeah, and I think the only exception is for Hanwha. Um, it's, it's either at Hanwha's stadium or where Hanwha is playing, you know, where the, I think they're playing the Wyverns this weekend. But anyway, I had heard that they have a local restriction where they're not, they're still not allowing fans. I guess you know they, it's, it's kind of like I guess the cities and local jurisdictions in this country. You know, it's like they have like different acceptance levels as far as gatherings and what to open and whatnot, that kind of thing. And I don't know, you got to respect that, you know. So, hey, you know what? It's a start. You know, you gotta dip a toe in the water before you can actually, you know dive in. That's why, like I said at the beginning, when Taiwan was only allowing a thousand people. Right. Okay. It still looked kind of empty, you know, from a television standpoint, but at least it was something. Right. To use as a model. And then you work your way up. Mm -hmm. And another re personal reason I got into it, Eric, was as a lot of people in this country, I was laid off from my job for, you know, because of the COVID. And I was trying to, I had been working a night shift job for two years. Well, one thing I wanted to do to get my sleep cycle into getting up for a day job was the KBO. Because their games would be 
uh, depending which day it was, 5.30, 4.30, something like that. And I wanted to get into a habit of getting up to watch baseball, get my cup of coffee, and once I got a job, you know, go to work. So, so I think it's another, po- it's just a personal positive I got out of it. But, like I said, baseball is baseball. And we were talking before about how people try to compare too much to major leagues. It's like, well, why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? You almost have to appreciate it as a different sport, as you had mentioned with the CPBL, especially with the fact that they're, they seem to suffer with their bullpen play. It's, it's, it doesn't seem like any lead is safe in that league. I mean, there was a game this week between the Twins and the Wiz where the Twins had a seven-run lead going into the bottom of the eighth against the Wiz, and the Wiz scored nine runs. And then... LC came back and tied it at the top of the ninth, and then the Wiz wound up winning with a walk-off homer. But, yeah, that, I mean, that was, that's one thing that could be a source of frustration, but also a source of excitement for a game. And, I mean, especially with their fans, it seems like their cheerleaders and their cheer squad, they're always playing music even if they're down by eight runs. But I guess it's because they've seen enough games where their team could come back. I don't know. What do you think about that? It's the old thing, like Yogi Berry used to say, it's never over till it's over. I mean, I saw the the live part of it on ESPN, and just the the whole ninth inning with the pinch hit homer by LG, and then Rojas comes up in the bottom of the ninth and wins it with a walk off. It was just an unbelievable thing. And I'm just thinking to myself, could you imagine that ballpark full in a normal situation? Oh, my goodness. It's almost, it almost would have been like, you know, an earthquake would have, would have hit that stadium. It would have, never would have been the same. <laughs> right, the crescendo would have been, you know, you would have heard like high tears. And then, I mean, they would have went bananas with the walk-off. I know it. It's, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, and, and that's kind of why I got into international baseball, because it's so different than our game in the United States, where there's constant cheering, there's constant chanting. Each player has their own individual uh, walk-up songs that it's played throughout their at bat, and it's just a whole different atmosphere than it is in the States. That's why I love the tournaments like the WBC and the Premier 12 and other international uh, tournaments like that. Because you just, you can't beat the fan sport. No, no doubt. I mean, it's, those games are a lot of fun. And, I don't know, maybe this is a personal observation. I don't know if you agree or not. It seems like the players seem like they have more fun, too. It does, it kind of reminds me of, like, not necessarily Little League, but I actually did some play-by-play for another, for an internet radio station for a local college here. And they played against the Naval Academy. And the Naval Academy, their players, they remind me of a little league team. They were, like, doing all the, like, the no batter, no batter, swing batter kind of thing. And they, they were, like, it was constant chatter in the dugout. And they were, like, having a good time. It seems like the Korean players do that, or I should say the KBO players do that as well. I think it's, I think it's that way worldwide. And that's kind of why I appreciate it. In 2017, the World Baseball Classic, where Israel went into Korea and they completely dominated that first bracket, beating not only Taiwan, not only the Netherlands, but the home Korean crowd. And it was just an unbelievable feeling to have an upstart team where that was actually one of the qualifiers. Right. That just swept through that entire bracket and went to Japan. Of course, they lost that uh, end of it to the Netherlands and Japan. But just the feeling of an upstart team making it through, traveling 8,000 miles across the world right. to basically conquer baseball powerhouses, mm-hmm. it's, it's fantastic. It is. And... It's interesting, their rules, I guess they were kind of lenient as far as nationals for that team, because it kind of reminded me of the Olympics, like with hockey, where they would have, like Team Italy would have a team, but they would have, they would allow Canadians or Americans who had, like, 
Italian grandparents Italian or something like that. Right. It, it, it was the same thing with, with the Israel team, where it, it was very hard to find an Israel league. They, they tried to actually set one up a few years back. Uh, there were a couple of Jewish players that actually went over to Israel and discussed forming some sort of league, but it never came to fruition uh, for one reason or another. But basically what they were doing was just taking any player that had a Jewish heritage and trying them out. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And it just jumped together. It was kind of cool. Yeah. But, yeah, like you said, the atmosphere throughout the world is it, a lot of fun. It's like, I remember seeing the interview with the, I forget the gentleman's name, but he's basically known as the Low T Superfan. He's the American professor who was actually employed by the Low T Giants to be a liaison for the American players coming in. Uh, he made a statement where he basically said, Major League Baseball is like the opera and Korean KBO is like rock and roll, I guess, as far as the crowd reaction. So, yeah, I, guess, I think that's an apt point, though. I mean, Major League Baseball here, it's known as like a relaxing kind of game or whatever. And, and plus the players here, I think they're, some of them seem like they're just grumpy mercenaries, especially when they're having this, their debates, you know, whether or not to play at all. I mean, it's just disgusting. It was almost to the point, I would, Eric, I'll tell you the truth, I was ready to bag Major League Baseball and just say, forget it, you know, I'll just watch well, Korean, you know, from here on out. Me, you know, I wanted them to play from the get-go. Unfortunately, circumstances where they were, where the country got shut down and nobody knew when they were going to play again, mm -hmm. I knew I was going to watch Major League. Right. But even with the KBO getting added onto the ESPN thing, I was watching KBO, NPB, and CPBL long before a pandemic. Right. So it was, it was all back to me. Hmm. To a lot of people it was new. Right. Like to you and a lot of other people and maybe our pages and the other groups that we follow. But I was doing it religiously from the get-go. So, I don't know. Right, yeah. So. Different for me. I, I just started following it more and started getting into it more, but Right. It was kind of old hat as far as watching stuff. Yeah, and I and typical ESPN fashion is like when they started promoting, it's like yeah, we're going to air these games. They kept talking about two things. They kept talking about the fans, which we really couldn't see, unfortunately, and the bat flips. I think they overhyped the heck out of the bat flips. It's kind of like, I mean, here it's more of a big deal because American, you know, major league teams look at that as disrespect and will charge them out and fight each other, but. The KBO, they do that all the time, and really, I haven't noticed it that much, though, Eric. I haven't seen too many, even the Korean players do it that much. I don't know. What do you, I mean, you've watched the league for several years. What do you think of that? Well, here's something that I didn't even realize until, I guess it was one of the ESPN broadcasts that brought it up. I think it was actually Eduardo Perez. And not necessarily backflips. Yeah. The whole thing is because in Korea, and it might be in other parts of Asia too, like in Japan or whatever, the stance is higher. So when you're releasing the bat, it automatically looks like a flip. That's interesting. Yeah, I noticed that too. It seems like a lot of the stances are either higher or they're just kind of awkward. Kind of remind me of like some of the un unorthodox pitching stances where you... Basically, they look like the Tasmanian Devil before they spin and throw the ball. But, I don't know, it's... The old Kevin Kirk Devil stance, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In fact, even like, I don't know if you have any merch from them, but I bought two shirts from MyKBO.net. Their main logo is a little, is a baseball player, like, the player's on one end of the my KB, the word MyKBO, and the other one, and the other end of it is the bat flying. So, I mean, it's... So, I mean, they kind of market that, I guess, a little bit. But, yeah, so, but it's like I said, though. Watch a game. If you'll notice, a lot of people, when they're, when they're batting, they're holding their bats higher. 
So even when they let go of the bat, it's going to look like a flip, but it really isn't. Right. That is interesting. I mean, it's usually, I mean, usually, I don't you probably had the same experience when you were a kid, but in Little League, they coach usually told you to choke up on the bat if, you know, if you were, like, small and, like, the bat was too heavy for you. I, you know, I don't know if that's the case with these guys, because they are professionals, even though, you know, might argue as far as the caliber of their, profe- you know, what league there are, but still, they're professional players. They're not guys that they get off the street, you know, a beer vendor, and it's like, okay, suit up and play ball. No, they're, I mean, they're still athletic, you know. So, I'm kind of surprised at that. And there's a different aspect of the game because in the ace leagues, there's more of a propensity for small ball. Right. There's not necessarily, you know, the five-run homer kind of thing. Mm. There's more of a bunting, move the runner over, steal the base, score the runner, you know, that mm. kind of thing. Yeah, and that's, that's another thing I enjoy about KBO. It's more, it's more strategy, I think, when they do that. Although there are some guys about, that can rake in that league. I mean, we talked about Rojas. God, that guy's a beast this year, Eric. He, he, was, he was a beast here uh, in the States. And it just seems so funny about how when players go over, their power numbers just seem to go through. I don't know whether it's the ball. I don't know whether it's the dimensions of the ballpark. But you'll see, you see in guys like Rojas, uh, Aaron Altair with the NC Dinos, mm-hmm. they're just raking the ball where they never got the opportunity in the state. Yeah, no doubt. I think the same is true with um, with Ramos. Although he's kind of cooled off, and I think the pitchers have caught up to him. That's how, that's, that was my, you know, a lot of people's impression of him initially early in the season. And he was kind of like, Colorado let him go? What are they doing? I mean, Colorado's, you know, that's a launching pad for baseballs, and they caught him? What, what, what's their problem? And this guy was killing it, but, you know, maybe that, maybe they saw a larger sample, and maybe that's why, but... Well, not only that, but I think they probably projected him more as a DH, mm-hmm. and, you know, up until this year with the pandemic, there was no DH in the National League. Right. So unless you traded him, he was of no value because uh, I believe they have Nolan Arenado at third, and I think their first base uh, position was pretty full at the time. So he was more, more or less blocked yeah. from any sort of major league opportunity with the Rockies anyway. Yeah, that's true. And I was looking at that, I'm thinking, hmm, left hand bat? I know a stadium that has a short right field ledge, he would come in handy. He, he would probably be enough. Problem is, if he came to the Orioles, he'd probably become another Chris Davis, where he would either hit a home run like 400 feet or strike out every other at bat. You know, so I don't know. Maybe. He wouldn't be stupid enough to ask for that bigger contract. I'm sorry? He wouldn't be stupid enough to ask for that big of a contract like Davis got. Oh, yeah. yeah probably that's... accept a hell of a lot less money. Yeah, yeah, they've had a history of that. I mean, you probably remember Albert Bell. They, they, got, they messed up, and Glenn Davis even before that. Good God, there's months, I swear. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, let me real quick go to the standings of the KBO right now. Uh, looks like I'm waiting for the computer to scroll up. I apologize, and hold on. Yes, okay, so leading the leaderboard for that for this league the dinos of course they're still they're still tearing it up and you know they're they're at the top seed right now followed by Tucson who got another win over LG it seems like they those teams they share the stadium but it seems like Tucson owns the twins um followed by the Kia Tigers then the Kiwum Heroes the third soul team then the LG Twins and then from 6 to 10, who are trying to fight for that fifth, stop, fifth spot to get into the KBO playoffs. We have the Samsung Lions, the KT Wiz, the Low T Giants, the SK Wyverns, and those fighting Hanwha Eagles. Mm. Now, Eric, one thing I wanted to ask you. Um, you and I have both been accumulating a lot of merch for different teams. Um, well, once again, I want to thank you for bringing the Kia Tigers program, which I found out from you that... They actually do had a spring training this past spring in Florida, and I know you had. And when you gave me that program, you had a KT Wiz hat on, 
And I gave you some NC Dino stickers that came with a LG Twins jersey that I bought. Um, do you have a favorite team in this league, or you just enjoy the league for, you know, just you just enjoy everybody and just enjoy the KBO as a whole? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. I enjoy the league as a whole, but what had happened last year, and I didn't even know about this, and it, again, it was one of those I have no life moments where I'm just sitting by a computer, and I stumbled upon, I, I actually think it was the MyKDO.net page, where it gave the spring training sites for that year. Mm. And I, it was actually in March uh, or in January that I was surfing the web on that. So I come upon the MyKDO page, and it lists the spring training sites, and it says that the SK Wyverns are training in Vera Beach, Florida at the old Dodger Temple. Oh, wow. So I decided to go over there because it was way before Major League Spring Training started. And I figured, okay, Dodger Town is nostalgic to me because I used to go to Spring Training with the Dodgers all the time before they moved out West Arizona. It was kind of a cool thing to at least investigate. Hmm. So I go over there, and I'm figuring that either practices are closed to the public or whatever. Right. Turns out that I'm the only one there. Oh, wow. As far as far as the fan goes. So the players and any sort of uh, management were so impressed that I really wanted to watch them work out. But they let me stay there. They let me hang out. Um, one of the PR guys had actually uh, found their spring training hat, so they gave me one, hmm. which I thought was pretty cool. Nice. Uh, the Americans on the team, one of which I knew from when he was with Tampa Bay, Jamie Womack, he's been a mainstay with SK for years. So he's basically telling me all this stuff, and I'm staying there, and I'm watching, and I'm getting a few autographs. And ironically, that was where I first met K.K. Kim, who is now a prominent member of the St. Louis Cardinals. Nice. Yeah, I think yeah, I think I, I think I saw a picture of you. With, I think you and I were talking about maybe you, uh, being one of the pictures that we post onto the show itself. Um, yeah, that was really cool. And I also noticed, too... Um, you had their foreign standout, Preston Tucker, this year, and also a manager of Matt Williams, who many people will remember near where I live from the Nationals. Also, I believe he was with Oakland and I think the Giants, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to double check on that. But yeah, it was interesting, I guess, to see him there. And the now the brochure, the program that you gave me was also interesting too. The fact that they are the Kia Tigers. It's laid out, it reminds me of a brochure that you would get at an auto dealership where it's cardboard and it's kind of like a folder that folds several ways and it has great pictures of all, everybody on the team, a little description of their stadiums in Korea, also the Dodger Town Stadium that you saw them there at. And uh, it's really nice, a really beautiful program. Again, I appreciate you commuting from Florida, meeting me halfway from there to your home in New York to give that to me, as well as meeting some of your other friends on the way home. And it was really nice. I, I appreciate you bringing that. You're absolutely welcome. It's my pleasure. It, it's funny because this is Kia's first year there. Uh, FK, as I mentioned earlier, they had apparently been in Dodger Town for about nine or so years as per an agreement that was set up with former Dodger Channel Park. Nice, okay. Who was a, a, pro, a prominent Korean pitcher. And apparently, when the Dodgers were set to leave for Arizona, there was some sort of stipulation that Channel Park would buy into Dodger Town and keep it alive only if he could put a KBO team in there for spring training. Hmm, nice. I didn't even know about any of this until Roma uh, told me about it last year once I found out about the whole situation. Huh. That's pretty, pretty cool. I mean, I, 
I mean, if I was down there, I would definitely dig that, especially after seeing those games. There's probably a few fans in North Carolina that would like the Dinos to do that. I mean, they've become their team. It's, I think I even joked on one, on the my KBO Facebook page. It's like if, if they wound up winning the Korean Series, I could see Durham throwing them a parade, you know, for a mile. I would actually love that. They, uh, I think it's them, Durham, and the Trump or Joe Biden, whichever you are elected in November, you might want to consider making Erica an ambassador to, to Korea or Taiwan. I mean, he, the way his, that man is networked through these players, I mean, he could, I mean, uh, you, you network, you're, it sounds like, especially from your Taiwan experience, it sounds like you're a rock star over there. You're almost like the baseball Brit for CPBL, I don't know. But. Yeah, it, it's absolutely awesome. Every time I go there, it's like, I'll get off the plane. There was actually a time in 2013 where I got off the plane and somebody had arranged for me to get picked up. And they took me to a sports bar and they had like a welcome to Taiwan party. Oh, no <laughs> it, was, it was the greatest thing. I mean, I'm getting off the plane and I'm suffering from jet lag, but hey, a party. All right, mental note. Another road trip. That, that's one will be for me. You and me go hang in Taiwan, and you, I don't know, bas basically, you know, introduce me. You're, I don't know, you sound like the mayor of Taiwan or, or of different cities over there. You, I don't know. I think I don't know. Like a, yeah, sounds like you are. All right, very good. There's well, actually, one super fan from uh, the Detroit, Michigan area, and when he's in Taiwan because he's an uh, ESL teacher. Mm-hmm. Which is a second language. He will go support one of the teams, and if you listen on the broadcast during the CTBL season, mm -hmm. he's the loudest one and always rooting for the monkeys. Okay. <laughs> so. Very cool. All right. Okay, folks. Well, we're going to take one final break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk to Eric about the CPBL and and maybe the NPE if we have any time, um, or any other leagues that we you know we catch our fancy at that moment. You're listening to Pro Baseball World Tour. We'll be right back. All right, folks, welcome back to our final segment of Pro Baseball World Tour here on YouTube. Brick Crab, Eric Marenbach. And Eric, since you are the ambassador of Taiwan, we're, I'm going to defer to your knowledge, sir, about the CPBL. Any happenings in that in this league, excuse me, in that league this past week? Well, the second half just started on Friday. 
Uh, the Brother Elephants actually won the first half quite handily over the Rackadin Monkey. Rackadin went on a tear right at the start of the season. I believe they were 15-5. and five. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, they progressively started to choke a little bit. I don't know what it was. They were actually touted as the team to beat. However, their manager, who managed them to a whole bunch of Taiwan Series victory, has switched team. Their, their manager now is a looking manager from, from standpoint. So what I think happened was the inexperience of coaching might have caught up with them. Mm-hmm. And Rackadin started to lose. Coincidentally, Brothers started to win. And with about a week and a half, two weeks to go in the first half of the regular season, Brother overtook him and proceeded to win the first half. Oh, wow. Interesting. And and as we mentioned that, I'm going over to the standings right now in the CPBL and. Now explain this to me. I'm again. I'm deferring to your knowledge of this league. They have what appears to be a first state stage and a second stage. Is that similar to what they have with the minor leagues here, where they have like a first half and a second half of the season? Is that how that works? Or? There, there, there are two halves. So and then the winners of each half uh, will basically go in the Taiwan series, unless a team wins both halves. And then they do like a wild card situation where the, the teams with the second and third best records will play against each other, and then the winner of that will play the top team for the Taiwan Series. Okay, interesting. So the winner of the – we're in the second stage right now. I'll get to that back real quick. Looks like the winner of the first stage for in the CPBL, it looks like it was – it was it was the brothers, the China Trust brothers. And then, the, and, yeah. Yeah, the Brother Elephants, yeah. Okay, Brother Elephants. And then in the second stage, it looks like, looks like the Fubon Guardians, am I pronouncing that correctly? They, it looks like they appear to be in first place with the Brother Elephants not far behind. Well, actually, yeah, they're right. half a game okay, under them. Yeah, the second half just started yesterday. So. Right, okay. Well, that would explain it. All right, pretty good. Um... Okay, so as you mentioned, they they've been having more fans at the stands of their games, and you said, as you mentioned, they also that they started their season earlier than any other league in the world. Is that correct? Right. Right. Nor- normally in Asia, as you probably well know, most uh, most if not all the leagues start in mid to late March. Mm-hmm. Taiwan, every, everything was everything got pushed back between Taiwan, Korea, and Japan, but Taiwan handled the pandemic better than everybody else. So they were the ones that forged forward and announced the start of the season earlier than anybody. Hmm. Okay. All right. And we're going to span a little further into Asia. We're going to maybe discuss the NPB League in Japan. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't followed NPB this for this year, I mean, actually, I haven't really followed it that much. Uh, although, only that I know that I want to go to the Japan Ball League Tour so bad with them, and it sounds amazing. I have a, one of my best friends who is also a Yankees fan. Um, he's from Yonkers, in fact. He's been to Japan twice. He hasn't been to any baseball games, but he and I keep talking about, you know, if we both get to go there, we're going going to some games, maybe some Yomiuri Yo Giants or somebody like that. Um I might yeah, be going. I'd, I'd love, I'm sorry, guys. I'd actually love to go myself. The reason why I keep going back to uh, back to Taiwan is because I've built so many friends there, and every time I go now, I always stay with one friend who lives actually ten minutes driving from the Brother Elephants in Taichung. So, oh, nice. Hop, <laughs> skip, and a jump to get there. Oh, very cool, very cool, and especially since this season. Again, I, I apologize, folks, for constantly bringing up Orioles, 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 especially since they are the bottom of the league, you know, of all the major leagues right now, pretty much. Them and the Marlins are kind of fighting yeah, for that. Yeah, they won today. 
Boston, didn't they? Yeah, they, yeah, they actually beat the Red Sox 7-2. to two. Of course, that was the night after getting slaughtered by those same Red Sox, 13-2. to two, But, you know, yep, we'll take what we can get. Good, good job, Birds. But one player I was definitely fond of when he played here, Adam Jones, is with the Oryx Buffaloes. And I see that they won the day against the Rakuten Golden Eagles. So, 6-3. So good for them. I definitely would love to see him play in, you know, any game in the I in the Tokyo Dome. I know Yomiori plays most of their games there, but I think they share might share with another Tokyo team there or two. But um yeah, I mean same thing as far as a fan fan support. I mean there's a there's a dancing, there's a chance, there's some music. Um it, you know, a lot of fan interaction, unique or at least, I wouldn't say unique to their league, but different from American baseball audiences. So, I mean, it just seems like a lot of fun. And what's nice about that too, Eric, I think I read a little bit about Japan Ball. What they do is basically you pay for a package. Um, I think including the package is the airfare, the hotel, and tickets to the tickets to the games. And what they do is they take a bullet train go up and down Japan to the different games. I think they do it like for a week in September, last I saw. Probably won't do it this year, but, you know, that's what they have done in the past. And I had also heard they were talking about doing a bus tour for the KBO. So, I don't know. Really? Yep. Yeah, I read it, either I read it in the My KBO site. I think somebody actually mentioned that there, you know. But I read it somewhere on Facebook. I think it was in the, that group, though. But, um... Game. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'll call I mean, it Arby. Yeah. I mean, it's a funny thing with that league, how that got started. I read a little bit about their history. Originally, it was started by a couple who had owned a Seattle Mariners minor league affiliate, and they used it to scout Japanese players to bring them over. Then eventually, other teams wanted to join them, and then after that, they just made it into a tourist group, you know, so... And he said, they, he said they they have a tradition of when they meet for like the first night, they would meet in a hotel, they would gather at a restaurant, and they'd have a drink together, and then they would just go to the different ballparks, and you know, and, and it sounds like a lot of fun. It sounds for what it is, it sounds affordable too, because I think you'd have to fly from Seattle, but I think when I read in there, everything was like I don't know, like five thousand dollars altogether. I mean, which traveling just to Japan itself could be expensive, but I mean. Figure you're doing that, and then you're going to all those games, and your hotel and your transportation. I mean, I don't know. That sounds like sounds like a week long party to me. I don't know about you, man. <laughs> like, I, like I said, sign me up. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And if the KBO did that, oh my god, it's like kill me there. I'll be like that, you know. I'll, I I don't think I would ever get any happier after that. You know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> but oh, absolutely, and it's funny. Uh, and a little shameless plug to another YouTube channel, DKTV, our buddy Daniel Kim. Uh, when I first discovered the channel, I actually asked him about the proximity of the KDO Stadium. Mm -hmm. So he's telling me distances between one stadium or, or another. And it would just be a fun thing to do. My whole problem is where to stay because I hear from the grapevine that some of the Korean hotels uh, that are in the localities and some of the ballparks uh -huh. are pretty expensive. Oh, wow. Okay. I figured they would be in Seoul because, I mean, Seoul's probably just as big, if not bigger, than New York, so I figured it would be expensive there, but I... If, kind of more metropolitan kind of thing. Yeah. Well, and well, one thing I had heard about that, too, I, I'm not sure if I heard correctly. I thought I heard on one of the ESPN broadcasts that all the stadiums are in, are within like a five hour drive. So it's like, you know, it's like, it's why like the players don't even fly to the stadiums. They just take like a nice coast bus. And, and, right. and also much to our chagrin as we saw this week, it seems like, it, you know, pretty much almost the whole league except for, except if there are any games in Key Wounds, Sky Dome, you know, are rained out. So. When it, rains, when it rains, it pours. As a matter of fact, that's why the Taiwan second half got started as late as it did. Because what they do is they will end the first half at one point, 
and then a lot for about a week, week and a half or so for their rainy season games to be made up. Mm, okay. And it was a stretch of about a week, week and a half in, I believe it was mid-June, where basically the entire week got washed out. Oh, my goodness. So they had to make up the games, you know, uh, early July. Mm. Wow, yeah, that completed. Yeah, well, oh, I'm good for them. It's yeah, it's amazing how a lot of stadiums. So I mean, in this country and o- and over there, it's like the drainage systems have improved. You know, where it's like I remember actually going to a single A game here where they actually got the whole game in, even though it was, not only did they get the whole game in, Eric, but they actually had fireworks on afterwards. I don't know how the heck they did it, but it was the Frederick Keys and. The Durham Bulls back when they were a single A affiliate for Atlanta, like, and yeah, it was crazy. It was, I mean, it was just pouring down rain, and I was used to like Oriole games where it would be like three drops of rain. It seems they would like you know have a rain delay and have like Rick Dempsey running on the tarp or whatever. But here, I mean, that game it was. I guess it was kind of like, I think it was a Saturday. I don't think it was like the go away game. I could see if it was like the go away game before they got on the bus to the next city. He would try to get it in, but I don't know. They got a whole they got a whole nine innings too. They didn't even have like a split seven inning double header deal either, but so what? Yeah. Very interesting. Although I was worried, I don't know if you saw the picture, Eric. It was I think it was at um Dunsel, the you know, the stadium for the twins and the Bears. It looked like it looked like Atlantis. I mean I don't know what happened with the drainage system. I'm, I guess they were able to unclog it or whatever. Wait, but was um, that the photo where it looked like it was under like two feet of water? Yeah, exactly. I was and I was blown away. It was like I saw twins and bears of twins. I mean, twins and bears. I'm like, oh yeah, right. How, they're going to get that in. What are they going to do? Playing submarines? But no, they got it in and they were able to drain everything. So good for them. I'm glad for them. You know, but. Yeah, more power to it. No kidding. All right, folks. Well, listen, we're going to wrap up for this week of Pro Baseball World, World Tour. I want to thank Eric again for joining us from his palatial estate. He'll be soon running for office as ambassador to Taiwan and Korea after we get off of here. But hopefully we'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. My pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. Oh